astrophotography from down under. All right, g'day everybody. How are you going? Um, so, what have we been up to down here in the southern hemisphere? Well, still not the best of weather. In fact, I've not had another clear night since my one clear night, the last one. But you can probably see back here I've got the old um, my little small rig set up, which is just the old Samyang um, 533 and my little Antlia uh, one-shot colour uh, filter back here. And um, I had those set up actually on the same night as I got my one clear night. So I set those both up on my smaller mount and I pointed them at the large, large Magellanic cloud, which is a nice fit for that sort of size sensor. Now, for those of you that don't live in the Southern Hemisphere, um, you'll probably see this time of year, you get a lot of pictures of like the large Magellanic cloud, the small Magellanic cloud, um, and then you get some like galaxies and you get some star clusters, you know, and that's because the Milky Way, you know, it's really sort of low and flat. So, you know, by 11 o'clock, a lot of those objects that you'd normally sort of take, maybe like Triffid Lagoon, Eagle, all that kind of stuff, it's all getting just too low. So the good thing is that we can always rely on like the Tarantula Nebula and the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud next to it. And then, you know, if you've got that sort of longer focal length, um, you've got the galaxies, which is one of the main reasons I actually got the C925 in the first place. Even though we've had a cloudy year, it gives you those options this time of year are getting closer in on some of those galaxies. Um, so what I did on that one night, like I said, I pointed the the 135, I pointed my small rig at that large, at the large Magellanic Cloud, and I did manage to get about six hours. So I thought we can have a look at that and just quickly how I processed it and how it looks. It's always a pretty beautiful object, um, and I never really get bored. There's different ways, you know, the Tarantula Nebula and the large cloud is so big that you can take it different focal lengths in different ways. And um, it's a bit like the Dragons of Ara for me. I just never get bored of taking it. Um, but what I did at the same time, because I had, I did have that time available to me before I could start imaging the two galaxies that night. If you look back at my old video of um, One Clear Night, you'll see that um, I couldn't really begin imaging those till about 11 o'clock. Um, so what I did is I pointed the C925, which is at 15... 50 millimeters so nice and close and I pointed it at the tarantula nebula just because I've never taken it that close so just basically getting the tarantula nebula in the frame and I took short 60 second exposures because I really was more interested in just looking at the core and I didn't want to blow anything out and just for a bit of fun because I've never done it before I just thought it might be interesting just to look at it really close up so I did manage to get a couple of hours of LRGB um, so I thought maybe today what I'll do is we can hop onto the we'll hop onto the PC in a while um, in PixInsight. We we'll just have a quick look at those two objects, uh, maybe how I processed them and um, any little challenges with them. But um, yeah, so if you want to stick around, we'll hop on and uh, and we'll take a quick look. All right, guys. Um, I don't want to spend. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because often with PixInsight you can get carried away and I can end up. Um, <laughs> explaining every every single step that I've done. All I'll say is that, so these are my 135 images that I got. I did try and do um, different length exposures on these um, and then I used the HDR tool to combine them. If you've never used that, it's very useful for just combining this HDR composition. Some good videos online, but basically you can add your two files so let's say you're working on something like the Orion Nebula and you've got a really bright core maybe you take some short exposures for the core and you take some longer exposures to bring out you know all your normal nebulosity you can use this to combine the two and therefore and um, still have still be able to tame the core and not overexpose it um, so worth looking at now in this case in the end I didn't really need to use that even with my 10 minute images they were fine but I combined all the data together, um, the usual steps, dynamic background extraction. I did do a uh, background neutralization on this. Um, now that's starting to get into the starless. One thing I'll mention is just that when I did take out the stars on this, 
and I was stretching the I was stretching the image. I did just use um, a little mask here just to protect the core. So you know, as I'm doing the stretch, just a soft stretch, just to bring out um, bring out the stars in the background, so I can extract my stars. I just at the same time as I'm doing that stretch, I'm applying that range mask, and therefore, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blow out the core as I'm doing that initial first stretch. So yeah, just to explain what I'm talking about here, like so if I'm doing my stretch, you know, and I want to take my stars, I can just use um, you know, I can have that mask applied there, and at least it means as I'm stretching the rest of my data, um, you know, I can keep I can keep this center under control. So if I just take that off for a second, you can see see how much more that center would be blown out. Now you've got to you've got to manage that a bit. Obviously, you can't have the center completely under as well. Maybe you do an initial stretch and then you do a further stretch. But just something to consider if you're needing to maybe stretch your image to do one thing, but you want to protect the other stuff. So anyway, that is where we were with that. Um, and then just the, you know, normal steps, taking the stars out. I have my starless version here. I didn't need to do a lot with this. I just did some basic curves work um, and used my, used my masks over here. You can see I didn't really have much to do. I had a magenta mask. I had a range mask. Um, and I just did some curves work with colors and... Um, I did just have to bring the background down a bit because it was getting a bit too red, which is why I used the masks. And it was fairly straightforward, really. Um, I let the, you know, I think in this case, you can let the data do quite a lot of the work. Um, I did end up using Blur Exterminator, I think, just on the starless image with this particular image. Um, sometimes you can have strange results with images like this, I think, if you use it. Um, at the beginning just because of how many stars and um, yeah so I found it was made more sense you just need to be aware when you use Blur Exterminator with starless images that you're not going to need all the settings in Blur Exterminator enabled the ones that relate more to stars so you do fiddle around and test first um, yeah and then we got our final you know we got our final image here which was you know, I was pretty happy with. It is a bit undersampled because I did not drizzle the data. And if I do add some more data to this, I will be drizzling it. But um, overall, pretty happy with that as an as an image and um, really nice globule look happening over here as well, which looks quite nice. There's a lot to do in this area. There's a lot, um, there's a lot you can focus on. So, you know, for us guys in the Southern Hemisphere, it gives us something to um, focus on this time of year, whether you're going to do it close or whether you're going to do wide shots like this there's a lot in there um, and then as far as the other shot went look i'll not spend very much time on this one but this was the so this was a c925 um lrgb but a dynamic background extraction um you can see if i take the stretch off of that obviously my intention with taking these 60 second exposures was that i would have be able to really you know, look inside the core, I guess, of the tarantula. Um, not a whole heap of data, like I said, only about two hours worth. Um, and then the red, red, green, blue channels. That was the red, green and blue combined. Looking a bit pastely at this stage. Um, but some nice, nice star colours um, that were coming out there. As you can see, some nice, nice little um, star colours here. Not you know, not the best image in the world, a bit soft, but I've got to remember I was taking, you've got to remember how much data you've got. So um, you can't expect, you can't expect miracles. Um, um, this was the stars taken out then, um, red, green, and blue with the stars taken out. And then, um, you know, we go on to our next image, just starting to stretch it a little bit um, and um, just trying to enhance those colors. Um, the, you know, obviously there's not going to be a lot of surrounding nebulosity because I'm doing 60 second exposures. Looking a bit purpley, obviously, now at this stage. 
Let's have a look. There we've got our luminance channel that's just had the stars taken out of it because obviously I'm not going to be using I'm not going to be using the stars on that channel. I just need the RGB stars. That's all looking quite good, and you can see that the center is under control. Um, these are our stars here, which are looking good. You know, it's a bit saturated these a little bit after I um, after I took them out. And where did we go from here? So we had, this is then our starless image. So first off, actually, we had our, we got our starless image here with the luminance applied to it. So that is starless plus the luminance. Still pretty soft. I have tried to get those purples back to a bit more of a red here. Quite, it was somehow it was quite difficult to manage the reds in this. They kept coming out, almost like kept coming out cherry red, no matter what I did. Um, and then I did some. Um, this was basically the same thing now, but with a bit of blur exterminator applied to it. Again, just be careful if you're using blur exterminator on a starless image, just to change your settings, otherwise you can get weird things happening if it thinks there's stars in the image. But as you can see, we're able to see nicely into the core now. Maybe I've, I don't know if that's maybe gone a bit too far and I've maybe over um, sharpened it here. Um, but like many things, it's a bit of a case of interpretation, isn't it? And then finally, let's just um, add the stars in. And here we are with the tarantula and the stars added in. This is actually another NGC number over here, over the right hand side here, which is, let's have a look. What's that one called? NGC 2081, that region off to the right. You can kind of see, look, that little sort of a, almost like a heart shape actually, hole. And then this area off to the right of it. So I think this is the, it's very faint here, but I think that's the heart shape that you've got almost there. And then that's that piece of nebulosity off to the right of it. A hydrogen region. But there we go, guys. That's pretty much it. Um, you know, we're able to at least see a few of the stars and we're really able to see, I think, into the, the core a bit more here. I guess because the stars have ended up on that bright, still that quite bright region they're not you know on that cyan region they're not that easy to see but at least we can see into the core and um, I think for two hours that was a nice little fun just a fun experiment to do all right guys so that's about it now and um, I hope you got something out of that or at least enjoyed the images um, and I'd just like to say thank you everybody who watches my channel um, thanks everybody for the likes and the subscribes that I keep getting. I don't get huge amounts, but I get a steady trickle and um, I do appreciate people who um, leave a comment or leave a like. I know there's a heap of astrophotography channels out there now. So um, yeah, you know, if you spend a bit of time on mine, I do appreciate it. So thanks for that. And I will see you. I'll see you soon on the next video. So clear skies to everybody.